Charles Sanders Peirce was born on September 10th, 1839 in Cambridge, Massachusetts. He was the second son of Benjamin Peirce, an eminent Harvard mathematician and astronomer. And his mother was Sarah Hunt Mills. She was the daughter of a senator, a well-known senator of the time. So he was born into a, an elite, um, socially, intellectually elite class. Since he was very young, his father recognized um, his genius and he saw in him greatness for the future. So his father took a very direct and personal supervision of his education. So really, per since he was very young, uh, was studying you know, theorems of mathematics. And, and he liked it. Um, when he was 12, it is said that he found a book on logic in his oldest brother's room. It was a copy of Watley's Logic. And he read the whole thing, and he was absolutely fascinated with it. And ever since then, he considered himself primarily a logician, in spite of all his varied interests. That's really what he liked and what he saw himself as being. By the age of 16, he says that he read The Critique of Pure Reason by Kant, devoted a couple of years to it, basically knew it by heart by then. And so throughout his whole life, he read philosophy, he read logic, and he had an encyclopedic knowledge of philosophy, so much so, that's one of the reasons why it is sometimes very difficult to understand what he's saying, because he's referring to all these different philosophers that many people today don't know or, or about or, or recognize. Now, he graduated with a Master of Arts from Harvard, and afterwards received the degree of a Bachelor of Science in Chemistry from the Lawrence uh, Scientific School, which had just been created. In the 1860s, uh, he uh, also took a job as an aide in the U.S. Coast Survey. His father was a superintendent of the institution at the time, and so he became an aide to his father. And this institution, which was one where, um, well, a lot of scientists were involved in, was concerned with taking measurements of the Earth to establish the shape of the Earth, to make maps, etc. And really, this was the position that Peirce held for over 30 years. It, it was really the one position that he held throughout his life, because he never really had a full-time academic position. That's what he really wanted, but he was never able to achieve it. In 1879, while he was still an aide at the um, U.S. Coast Survey, he was offered a lectureship in logic at John Hopkins. John Hopkins had just been created. It was a graduate institution and very fast became the graduate um, institution for research in science. And Peirce spent five years there. He accepted the position always, well, with the hope and the understanding that the position would turn into a, a permanent academic position with tenure. But because of the circumstances of his life, and some people will attribute it to his difficult personality, others to his personal life, by this time, his first wife had left him, and he took on with uh, Juliette Fossi Portelai, who became his mistress. He eventually married her. But of course, this we're talking about the 1800s. This was just not done, and someone in Peirce's social class just did not do that. That was scandalous behavior. And so when, when this was known, um, it is thought that that is one of the reasons why his position was not extended to a permanent one. Also, some people say that he had some very powerful enemies due perhaps to his difficult nature, but also, I think, because of some professional jealousy, because Peirce was really, truly a genius. His um, body of work is staggering. His interests were not just in philosophy 
or in geodesy, which is the measurement of the Earth, but he was an astronomer. Uh, he was a chemist by training. He was a logician. And well, he has many inventions. Some people say that he foresaw the electronic wiring for computers. He anticipated several mathematical propositions, the Sheffer stroke, quantification in logic. He's a pioneer in semiotics. Um, before that, uh, semiology had been considered to be a dyadic relationship. That's a two-way relationship. Peirce claimed that it was a three-way relationship. This, of course, has to do with his theory of categories and such. He anticipated, some people say, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle with his cosmology. So the man was just ripe with ideas, very creative. With cartography, he realized that some of the measurements that were made with pendulums were due to a, the defect in the equipment. And actually, he was recognized in Europe in the um, Academy of Science meetings as being, you know, an eminent scientist. Actually, he was more recognized tragically in Europe as a scientist than in his own country. He also was the first to measure the meter through a spectrometer. Also made some interesting claims about the magnitude of stars because he worked at a point when he was very young in, in the Harvard Observatory. So I think some people were indeed jealous of his intellect and, and his creativity. But as, as I also mentioned, he was a difficult person. He was not in the best of health. He self-diagnosed himself as having facial neuralgia, which is a very painful nervous condition which uh, of the face and he struggled with that all his life and he also talks about having bouts of paralysis so um he definitely was not an easy person now on the other hand his his sisters and letters from his relatives describe a very sweet and an understanding person. Definitely he had two wives which loved him. Um, the first one, well, she says she left him because of his reckless behavior and she was trying to shock him into realizing that he needed to organize his life and his economic situation better. And his second wife was devoted to him till the end. Um, and, and he was devoted to both his wives. Some people describe him as being a shy person. Um, he's also described as being a brilliant conversationalist. William James, who was his friend and colleague, he, well, described his philosophy as brilliant flashes of light in a Sumerian darkness, acknowledging his genius, but basically also acknowledging the fact that he was very difficult to understand. And Peirce himself admitted that too. He said that because he was left-handed, he did not have a facility for language, but that he did have a facility for diagrams, which is how he explains his genius in logic and in coming to all these theories that he basically says he thought in a different way. He thought in a diagrammatic way, uh, different to how other people think. And some people have studied this and have said that, indeed, this is a trait of genius, like Einstein. They, they think differently than, than how other mere mortals do. Peirce was well known for all these other I guess we could call non-philosophical things, at least in Europe and, and here too. Um, he, he did become a member of the National Academy of Science eventually. And during at least his first few years in, in the U.S. Coast Survey, he was respected for his studies. That was not the case towards the end when he was forced to resign after 30 some years, due again to some personal enemies, I guess we could say, and, and also took his time in writing reports, again, he thought in a logical way different to how others thought. So, so some people accused him of his reports not being understandable at all. Now, in terms of his philosophy, he covered really the whole gamut. Peirce thought that philosophy, at least 
metaphysics was in dire straits. And he thought that philosophy should be approached from a scientific point of view. Now, we have to remember, Peirce was a scientist. He was a chemist by training. So he proposed to approach philosophy using the scientific method. By the way, he never really published his grand philosophy in a book. He published many papers. He published reviews. He wrote around 16,000 entries in the uh, Century Dictionary, but he never really wrote his grand logic, which was what he proposed to do, but he, for many reasons, never accomplished. So one of his first papers had to do with analyzing the state of philosophy. And I guess he figured that, of course, Descartes was commonly believed an influence in current or modern philosophy. Descartes supposedly uh, did the break from scholastic philosophy to, you know, the quote, modern philosophy. But Peirce took issues with what Descartes said. And in this paper, he talks about questions concerning certain faculties claimed by, uh, for man, the faculties that Descartes claims. He takes issues with four of them. And you can see his pragmatism coming out of this very early paper, even though he doesn't even use the term. He doesn't actually use the term until much later. James is the first one who uses the term pragmatism. Um, in 1898, he gives Peirce the credit for using the term. And even though we can trace Peirce's ideas about pragmatism all the way back to the 1860s, Peirce doesn't actually use the term right then. Descartes talks about us having intuition, right? And he talks about clear and distinct ideas and how, how do we know things? Well, we have a clear and distinct idea about them. So for, for Descartes, this was a criterion of, of meaning, but also a criterion criterion of truth. Now, Peirce disagreed. Peirce thought that there is, and that's one of the claims that he makes, there is no such thing as intuition. Um, we don't know things just by thinking that they are clear and distinct ideas. And he, he goes into a lot more of how we acquire knowledge in another paper 10 years later. Um, the second intuition that, um, that or the, or the second concept that Descartes talks about, and that's introspection. Peirce also disagrees with that, and he kind of turns Descartes on his head about that, because Descartes says, well, what, the only things that we can know are the, th the thoughts that are inside our head. And then Descartes builds his system of knowledge based on, well, I know, you know, I think, therefore I know, you know, I can only know what's inside my head. But Peirce disagrees. Actually, Peirce says, no, that's totally wrongheaded. We know things from the external world. And that also has to do with the third claim that he disagrees with, with Descartes. And that is the idea that we can really, um, attain knowledge of the world just by considering our own thoughts. Um, again, um, for Peirce, thinking is only with signs. And the only way that we can gain knowledge is through our through what is present in our thoughts. And what is present is a reflection, we can say, of what's externally out there. So in other in the only way that we can know about the world in in, in other words the only way that we can know about ourselves is through the world. So it's not the case that we know that I know that I am a self and then I look at the world and here and this and in this I think Peirce uh, actually anticipated Piaget in, in, in his um, theory of development. Our idea of self, Peirce says, is developed through our experience with the world. So we have these things that are present in our thoughts and as experience reacts against, and he describes it against my will, when I realize that, you know, if I want this chair, this, this table to come to me, or if I want this chair to move just by my thinking of it, I realize, oh, wow, there's something else besides me there. That's how I 
achieve my thought about self. And so, again, turning Descartes on, on his head and using the idea of the British empiricists that the knowledge that we gain of the world is through our experience, our sensory experience that then, then turns, and here's the development of a sign theory, turns into signs in, in our mind. And that is the basis of our knowledge, is really signs. And so in his paper in, in the 1870s, in The Fixation of Belief, he continues this anti-Cartesian criticism of the state of philosophy when he talks about how we acquire beliefs and how we acquire knowledge. And um, he uses the, the, the difference between doubt and belief that Descartes uses. But of course, what Descartes says is that in order to attain knowledge, we have to doubt everything and then see if there is anything that we cannot doubt. And of course, that is the thought that I think, therefore I am. And, and that then is the foundation for the whole theory of knowledge about the external world. Again, Peirce thought that that was completely the other way around as to how things really work. Um, Peirce thought that um, Actually, doubt is, and he defined doubt as a state of uh, dissatisfaction, and that belief is a state of a pleasant, satisfied state. So doubt arises not as a paper doubt, like Descartes says, okay, so now I'm going to doubt everything. No. Uh, per says, we are, we, we doubt when we, only when we are forced to doubt by experience. And so what Peirce is doing is he's saying, look, we have a certain, we work with a certain set of beliefs and these beliefs are questioned only when we are forced to question them by our interaction with nature, by our experience. And this actually is a very Darwinian um, explanation. We acquire knowledge through experience with the world. We become more knowledgeable through experience with the world. And so um, then Peirce goes further to say that therefore all inquiry or all search for knowledge is really um, a search for the settlement of opinion, the settlement of belief. And then he talks about how the four different methods that people acquire belief. And um, they're all methods, they're the, and, and they are all relatively successful, but of course one of them is the most successful, the one that he recommends. And that's the fourth one, the scientific method. The first method is, he calls the method of tenacity. And that is when we, when we acquire beliefs, that once we've acquired our beliefs, we don't want to let them go, no matter what the experience says. And he says, well, yes, you, you can certainly claim to know things that way, but it's kind of a, a failed method because there will be a time when experience will really impose herself on you and you will have to change your beliefs. So that's not a very good method of settling beliefs, right? That you will have beliefs, but your beliefs will constantly be unsettled. They will have to be doubted and you will be in a constant state of dissatisfaction because you will have to see that you have to acquire new beliefs. A second method is the method of authority. The method of authority is kind of a social method, and this is when institutions like religion tell you what to believe. Again, relatively successful. People will claim to have sets of belief based on that method, but again, there will be, if you compare what other people believe, there will be times when you will have doubt and you will have to then settle that doubt. The third method is the a priori method, and that is the method that is agreeable to reason. So I acquire my beliefs according to what I think is reasonable. Now this again, this is even more successful, but again, not the best solution. Why? Because sometimes I could really be mistaken about what I think is reasonable, right? 
and some and, of, and then of course reasonableness is as per says due to fashion right sometimes when times change what's reasonable changes so for purse the best method of settling belief the best method for gaining knowledge for gaining truth about reality and, and Peirce does think that there is such a thing as truth, that there is such a thing as reality and that has to do with other notions that I will get to. Uh, the best method is what he calls the scientific method. The reason why it's the best is because it does not depend on the individual. For Peirce, the individual is the source of error and ignorance and it is only when a group of inquirers, and he called them scientists, but for Peirce, a scientist is a much broader term. It's someone who really wants to get at the truth. So uh, a scientific method then is that method of settling beliefs uh, by a community of inquirers who are intent on getting at the truth and who have sufficient time to devote to that endeavor. That final opinion of the community of inquirers after sufficient time to devote to the issue, that final opinion is what Peirce will then say is the truth. Um, and uh, the real will be the object of that final opinion. Now, that final opinion is that is not a prediction of the future. He's not saying that there will be a moment in time necessarily when this community of inquiry will then have resolved, uh, come up with all the answers to all the questions that we have. No, Peirce with time phrased it better. And he, uh, what, he, what he was trying to say is that the truth is that which would be the result of a community of inquirers given enough time to investigate. So a subjunctive, right? What would be the result were these people um, involved in getting at the search for truth, um, eventually what their conclusion will be. A remarkable feature of Peirce's philosophy, and it, it makes it very difficult to understand, but also um, incredibly rewarding once you've got it, is that it truly is an architectonic system of philosophy, meaning that it really does encompass, or he really tried to encompass, everything that um, we can actually think about things. And this was a purpose that he had. I mean, Kant had this very same purpose, Aristotle too. It's trying, you know, philosophy was supposed to be the explanation of how things are in, in the world. By world meaning everything, not just the external, but also, you know, in Cartesian terms, the internal world, etc. And Peirce really tried. He said that he would come up with a system so comprehensive that the only thing that would be left would be the filling up of details. And, and so all the different parts of his philosophy, they do come together, kind of like a Rubik's Cube. And they are all tied together. And, and small adjustments that he did in, for example, in his um, philosophy of logic had an impact on his metaphysics. What he said about metaphysics had an impact in his logic and in his theory of science and in his mathematics. It's amazing. Now, going back to what Peirce said about belief, he also described belief as a habit. Just as doubt was something that would cause immediate action, because once you were in a state of doubt, you were uncomfortable, and so you wanted some equilibrium, you, you needed to be in the state of belief, Belief also led to action, but it was a much more indirect one in the sense that if you had a belief, what did that mean? That meant that you had a habit of acting in certain ways. And Peirce, I think, came 
to talk about this idea of habit and connecting belief with experience, which is really what pragmatism does, right? Um, I think he was influenced by Alexander Bain. And Peirce does talk about how when um, a group of young men, um, including Peirce and William James and um, Oliver Wendell Holmes and uh, Nicholas St. John Green, and these were a group of friends when they were very young, they formed a metaphysical club. Remember that Peirce, since very young, he, was, he had an interest in philosophy. And they discussed philosophy under the idea of um, something that Alexander Bain had said. And, and he had said that belief is something that causes a man to act. Peirce has traced his idea of pragmatism to those discussions in the metaphysical club with William James. And that's when that, those first ideas of pragmatism came to be. So Peirce eventually came to describe what he talked uh, about pragmatism. Uh, for Peirce, pragmatism was a criterion of meaning. Remember, Peirce wanted to reform philosophy into a scientific kind of endeavor, uh, something like what Kant did, established a system based on logic, right? And what Kant wanted to do was to talk about the um, bringing the, the manifold of sensory um, uh, per perceptions to a unity. In other words, to understand all these sensory perceptions that we have. And what Kant did, he, he established a system of 12 categories, thinking of things in, in, in judgments about quality, quantity, manner, modality, which of course was based on what Aristotle talked about. Aristotle talked about 10 categories, right? So Peirce took that very same road. And so when he was reforming philosophy, he wanted to get rid of a lot of what he called metaphysical gibberish and a lot of concepts that he thought, like, for example, the, the, the concept of substance. Well, what's substance? You know, it's, well, form and matter, so what is that, you know? So he wanted, so he says, well, look, the pragmatism is going to be a criterion of meaning, um, didn't exactly use those words, but that's what it eventually ended up being. Um, it is going to tell us the meanings of hard concepts. Now, again, how do we acquire concepts through our beliefs? What are our beliefs? They are habits. Um, and, and what are our habits? Well, remember, they are, we, we get our beliefs from what is present to us in our mind. What is present to us in our mind? Signs. Okay, so we can only think in signs. So we can, uh, so signs are the only things that are cognizable. Okay, so um, any concept that we talk about is then going to have to be related to our experience with those external things that are somehow present in our mind, which are signs. So, to give an example, when um, philosophers like Plato and, and Aristotle tried to define the concept of, let's say, hardness, well, you know that Plato talked about, well, um, you know, a concept, a, a thing is hard if it participates in the form of hardness, and hardness is a form that is out there in the realm of forms. And then, of course, Aristotle said, no, you know, I don't like this idea of having, you know, the, the world of, that we're in and then another realm. No, no, no. The forms are in this world. And then the hard thing, if there, there is a form of hardness, but it is somehow in the thing itself. Okay. Now, Peirce said, you know, I, we need to make this a little bit easier. This thing about a form being in something, that's very difficult to understand. Let's relate it to experience. So when we say that a diamond is hard, what does hardness consist in? Well, it consists in the experience, let's say, of, of a diamond if somebody tries to scratch it. If somebody tries to scratch it and the diamond... Um, will not scratch. That's what it means to be hard. 
So what Peirce does is he, he ties the meanings of hard concepts to um, experiences. And by doing that, he tries to get away from what he called all the metaphysical gibberish, which really, uh, according to him, were clogging the advancement of philosophy. Now, that doesn't mean that Peirce was against metaphysics. Actually, he um, had some very important metaphysical claims that even James and certainly Dewey and, well, many people after him thought that he really went overboard with his metaphysics. And, and of course, I'm relating to Peirce's position about realism. Peirce claimed that the, the controversy going all the way back to scholastic or medieval times between um, realism and nominalism, um, that is the realism of concepts, that it was Don Scotus, the uh, scholastic realist, who got the thing right, as opposed to tradition, um, that thought that it was William of Ockham, the nominalist, who got things right in terms of metaphysics. What do I mean by that? Well, basically, in a nutshell, because of course this is very difficult, uh, you know, to explain so many uh, theories and, and years of thought in a few minutes. Um, Don Scotus claimed that concepts are real. Of course, Plato one said that, that forms were real and that was the basis of concept and of knowledge. Now, um, Scotus thought that it was important to claim that concepts are real because if they're not, then we cannot make any claims to knowledge if our knowledge is based on something that's unreal. But unlike Plato, who claimed that the reality of things was based on these forms, that these were the real things and not this world of sensory, unreal things, right? Uh, what Scotus said was there's a difference between, and Peirce actually says, you know, talks about nominalistic Platonism um, as opposed to Scotus' idea of realism. What did he mean by that? Well, Peirce says that for Plato, the forms, in a sense, existed. So it was a case that they were real and that they existed in a different realm. What Scotus does is he makes a distinction between reality and existence. Something can be real without existing. And obviously, all things that exist are real. So in other words, um, reality is not exhausted by existence. This, according to Peirce, was an incredibly important thought that somehow got lost in the shuffle because Occam, who was uh, Scotus's nemesis, claimed, no, how can a concept be real? No, only existent things are real. That was the nominalist um, view, which kind of pervaded and actually pervades even today. So Scotus, according to Peirce, was the one who actually got the controversy over universals, and that's what I've been talking about. You know, the forms, the, 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 the scholastics then talked about universals, talking about concepts, because that was, you know, how can we talk about, uh, you know, fish being a universal, in what sense can we use that same word to describe all these different things? Ah, because we all have the concept of a universal. But where does that come from? It has to be somehow real, right? And Scotus attempts to explain what it means that it's real. And he talks about a common nature and that isn't really physically in the thing, but somehow we abstract the common nature, the nature that's common to, let's say, all the fishes. And so now we have this concept, this sign of fish in our head. And that's why we can use language and we can use it effectively. So when Plato talks about, well, why can we use the same term of fish to all these different creatures, his, his thought was, 
Well, because they all participate in the form with a capital F of capital fishness, and this form somehow resides in another realm, the realm of the forms. That's where the real world is. And our world of sensory perceptions, uh, uh, these are just reflections, right, of, of the real form fishness. So all these different little creatures, they are, we can call them fish because they somehow participate in the form of fishness. Now, this was for Peirce a nominalistic kind of view because the idea of real and existence is tied together. And what Peirce claims that Scotus saw is that existence and reality are two different things. Obviously, all things that exist are real, but not all real things exist. And now, as this is where the scientist comes in, this is where Peirce adds to scholastic realism. Because at some point, he does say that Scotus also had a touch of nominalism. And the reason is that for Scotus, um, the basis of the real, of the common nature, is the individual. The common nature cannot exist by itself. It can only, fishness can only exist as long as there are fish. So the real depends on individual particulars. And Peirce did not want to say this. And this is where the scientist Peirce comes in and where he adds to uh, Scotus's realism because he says, ah, laws are real. And there can be no science without this notion that concepts are real, that reality is not tied to existence. A law is real and a law has meaning. And so the law does not depend on the um, existence of all the particulars. He also talks about generality. And it is this, this same idea that you cannot exhaust a description of the world by just talking about the objects that we perceive with our senses. The, the law of gravity, again, um, it, that's not something we perceive the effects, but we don't perceive the law as itself. And who is going to say that the law is not real? So that is the scholastic realism of Peirce. And it is something that James thought that Peirce was really going too far into, you know, scholasticism. And, and, and I think it's because people just have not wanted to, to really go into Scotus and what Scotus says and compare it to what, what Per says. You cannot be a pragmatist unless you're a realist. You cannot be a scientist unless you're a realist. Because uh, again, realism um, recognizes the reality of law the reality of, of generality, the reality of, of, of relations, of mediation. Now that brings me to um, another element of Peirce's thought, which is his theory of category. And Peirce described his theory of categories, like I said, he was following the same path as Aristotle and as Kant in trying to describe the world in these, in these very basic elements. Now, Peirce thought that he could reduce, and he did, Kant's 12 categories to three. And he did it, and he derives his categories in several ways. He, described, he, he derives them from a phenomenological point of view, from a semiotic point of view, from a logical, mathematical point of view. He does all these different derivations and he always comes up with the same uh, conclusion, that there are three categories. Now, from a phenomenological point of view, and let me go back, um, Peirce classified all sciences in his later classification, which is the one that, that stands. He said that all knowledge can be divided into all these different sciences. He first starts with the most basic science and, and they are hierarchical with the top one being the most basic and the bottom ones relying on principles on the previous one. 
uh, mathematics is the most basic one, and that one derives necessary conclusions from hypothetical constructions. Underneath mathematics is philosophy. Philosophy is concerned with the real world, we could say, and that includes everything. Right, And he then subdivided philosophy into three subdivisions. The more basic one is phenomenology, and that has to do with a study of what is present to our consciousness, to our mind. Um, then after phenomenology, he has the normative sciences. Under the normative sciences, he has aesthetics, ethics, and logic. Um, logic as theory of right reasoning. He also talked about, he talks about, he has two different kinds of logic. Formal logic, which is more in, in the mathemat, a special subset of mathematics. Uh, under the normative uh, category of, of philosophy, he has it as theory of right reasoning. Because again, it's normative, so it has to do with right reasoning. And then after normative um, philosophy comes metaphysics. And after metaphysics come the special sciences, history, um, you know, um, physics, chemistry, etc. The difference between the special sciences and philosophy is merely the fact that for the special sciences we need special equipment. Whereas philosophy, which for Peirce is a science, we use the scientific method to get at the truth, we don't need special equipment. All we need to do is just think about phenomena and think about the world. So in terms of phenomenology, the categories, which are those elements of thought that are present in consciousness, he differentiates three different things. Um, the first is that thing that depends on nothing else. And he describes this as what is instantly present before we make a judgment about it. Now, obviously, when I'm talking about firstness, it's no longer, no longer firstness because I'm talking about it. And so I'm making a judgment. I'm using language. You're understanding what I'm saying. So that element of presentness is lost. Now, but Peirce describes that there is such a thing, and in, in, in trying to use an example, he says it's like the color of red, that first presentness of the color of red, before you tell yourself, ah, I'm looking at something that's red. Once you, you make a judgment, then you have a second, because now you have a reaction. You, you, you know, some, something is perceiving something else. So that's the element of secondness, the element of reaction. So you need two things to react. Present is one, right? Just bam, that. And then thirdness is the relationship between the two things. So when I use language, that is an example of thirdness because it stands to something else, to someone. So it's, it's a triadic uh, relationship. You could say he forced himself, but what, what he would say is that he always came to that conclusion, and actually he does say that himself. Um, some people have called him a triadomaniac because he does, he talks about threes, you know, in, in, in sign theory and phenomenology and cosmology, in the categories, it always seems to come down to three. Some people have speculated and they've given it another twist. His first wife was a um, Trinitarian and talked about the Trinity, you know, the, the God, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And some people say that's when he first started to see things in three. I'm, I'm not sure uh, if that's, that's true, although he does at some point does talk about the Trinity. So I, I, that, that's, that's speculation. But the idea is to reduce the elements of experience to the most basic concepts. And he went one better, or actually nine better than, than Kant, and he reduced the 12 
to, to three. Kant increased the 10 from Aristotle and Peirce says, no, the, the 12 that Kant describes can actually be described in terms of threes. And he actually also took this notion of three to logic as well. Um, he, he claimed that there are three relations and in he used, well, he, he came up with his system uh, of existential graphs, which were a very creative and original way to diagram what he thought was the process of thinking. That's what he was trying to do. And that was actually how he thought. He explains this by, for example, drawing a dot on a piece of paper where the dot is meant to show firstness. You know, it's, it's just a point. But once you draw it on a piece of paper, now you have secondness because you have the black point on a white sheet of paper. But then now it's also a third because the paper is the medium that unites the dot and the whiteness. So that is how he, he tries to explain this idea of firstness, secondness, and thirdness, and also with relations. For example, the relation of John gives Mary an apple, he says could be explained with a triadic relationship. And no more and no less than a triadic relationship, right? Um, if, if you try to explain it in any different way, you could always reduce it to the, those three relationships. And that's actually one of Peirce's some people call it Peirce's theorem, that a relationship that involves four variables can always be reduced to relationships with threes. Peirce, he was very well versed in the history of philosophy. And he was, in, in, in that sense, he was very democratic and a very generous person because he believed that the, the great thinkers all had something to contribute. And he, he, he actually described himself as standing on the shoulders of giants. So he thought that Aristotle's idea, Kant's idea, they had merit. And he thought that there was a merit in describing, trying to describe the elements of the world in these, in these kinds of, of ways and categories. He also used this idea of, of a trio or of a triadic nature when he talked about cosmology because he too had a, had a theory about cosmology and how the world came to be. He talks about how originally the world was a total chaos. And we can see some pre-Socratics who had this idea, right? And he gets the, to that from the very scientific concern of trying to explain where do natural laws come from. And he thought, you know, just an explanation of, uh, you know, the second law of thermodynamics deriving from another law, that's not really an explanation. What we need is where do laws come from? And, and so his cosmology is meant to be an explanation of that. So in the beginning, there's total chaos. There's pure chance or pure possibility, as he calls it. He gives it a, a term, tychism, is this element of chance that's, you know, just prevalent. And then little by little, there's flashes of things happening. That, of course, that's where we have secondness. But when they start happening and they start happening together and repeating, and as I said, take on habits, because he thinks that nature takes on habits just like we do. We are part of nature. That's another of his key elements is this idea of continuity or cynicism, right? So things start taking on habits. They start becoming regular. That's where thirdness comes in. Things become regular. Things become law-like. Now, there's always this element of chance in the world. And Peirce thought that laws are not perfectly regular because there's still tychism. There's less than in the beginning. So in a sense, the world out of chaos is coming ever more regular until it actually becomes absolutely regular or crystallized. That's his cosmology. And again, we see 
Firstness, which is possibility or chance. Secondness, reaction, right? Thirdness, regularity, law-like mediation. And he anticipated um, all these thoughts. Um, again, another reason for people's fascination with Peirce's philosophy, because he, he did seem to anticipate a lot of the things that are happening. Now, tragically, though, these things were anticipated almost in isolation because Peirce, like I said, never had an academic position. It, it was a very, very frustrating for him, uh, not just because he, he, he wasn't doing what he thought he was meant to do, was to be a logician and, and to come up with and illuminate philosophy with his grand theory, but also it affected his, his um, economic situation because he did not have a means to survive. And not only did he die, he, he, did he die in poverty, but his book that he wanted to publish, he was unable to, pu to publish he, because he was, well, concerned with the day-to-day -day things of trying to not to starve, take care of his ailing wife, Juliet, who also had a lot of health problems, his own health problems, trying to manage a RISB, the, the farm to which he retired after he realized that he couldn't get an academic position. And it actually became a huge economic burden. However, in, in spite of all these adversities, starving, at, at many times. Um, well, his income eventually came from writing reviews, uh, writing for the Century Dictionary, and towards the end, really on the charity of his friends, including William James and, and his relatives. In spite of that, the man wrote constantly and furiously every day. Well, it, it is calculated like 100,000, it is said, pages of his manuscripts of scraps of paper. And they are in um, the um, housed in, in Harvard. His wife, upon his death, and, and like I said, he died in abject poverty on April 19th, 19, 1914, sold a box of his manuscripts and his personal library to Harvard. And it stayed, the, these pages stayed in Harvard until about 20 years later, Charles um, Hartshorn and Paul Weiss put some of these papers arranged thematically in what is considered, in six volumes of what is called the collected papers. And about 20 years after that, Arthur Burks came out with two more volumes. So we're talking about 40 years after Peirce died. As I said, these papers were put together thematically. So they are many times confusing because they're not chronological. And Peirce, like any philosopher who constantly thought and wrote about his system, did make some adjustments and some changes. He didn't make a complete turnaround. When he changes the name of his pragmatism to pragmaticism, it isn't that he changed his thought about it. It was that once the term was out there, made famous by William James in his 1898 paper, people started talking about it. And of course, James had his version of pragmatism. And Peirce was very disappointed with what people were calling pragmatism because he felt, wow, this is something that I came up with and that's not really what I meant at all. And so he says, okay, so I'm going, okay, so you guys can have the term pragmatism and I'm going to invent a term that's ugly enough to, um, to be safe from kidnappers. And my term is going to be pragmaticism. And so Peirce really, as I was saying, when he wrote furiously, he did make some changes. So it, um, the collected papers sometimes misguide people as to Peirce's thought. In the 70s, uh, Carolyn Isola came out with a collection of Peirce's mathematic and scientific papers. 
And around the same time, the Purse Edition Project, which is still going on, and it's based at Indiana Purdue University, is, is in the process of putting it together in a chronological fashion. I first became interested in Purse as a um, graduate student in, in the Department of Philosophy at the University of Miami. A new professor came from the University of Warwick, and that was Susan Hawk, and she offered us this class in pragmatism. And that is when I first learned of Peirce. And it's strangely enough, and I say strangely enough because I, I don't think this is a common thing as to why people are initially uh, attracted to Peirce. What I liked about Peirce was in his interest in medieval philosophy. I was interested in medieval philosophy, had taken courses um, with um, Dr. Raymond Lemus at, at, at the University of Miami, and, and, and I was fascinated um, by it. And so here was this um, man from the 20th century who was actually quoting Don Scotus and saying he's the one who got it right. And, and also with a certain puzzle, because he never really explained it too well. And, and, and like I said, sometimes he would call Scotus too much of a nominalist when he was you know, feeling critical. And, and so that is how I, I became interested in Peirce. And, and since then have devoted my research to, uh, well, initially, to what he meant by when he called himself a scholastic realist of an extreme stripe, more extreme than even SCOTUS. When I was a graduate student doing my dissertation, I was awarded a um, summer fellowship at Virginia Tech. And while there, I was offered a position in the philosophy department. I was there for eight and a half years, and I taught a lot of purse while I was there. And I've been with, uh, the, with Miami Day College as Chair of Arts and Philosophy now for four years. And when I teach um, my Intro to Philosophy class, I try to bring a little bit of purse also in there as well. I think for, for many reasons, semioticians are interested, not necessarily the philosophers of, of science, but semioticians who deal with other kinds of disciplines that also deal with science are interested in what per says. Uh, mathematicians are also interested in many of the discoveries that Peirce um, made. And of course, philosophers mainly because of, well, the whole gamut of, of what he said. Uh, his, his idea that you could have an entire philosophical system that, that could really explain everything. The anticipations uh, about all the different theories in science, in cosmology, etc., I, I think st still make Peirce fascinating. And it's an ongoing thing because, well, first, Peirce never really finished his philosophy. He never really wrote his grand book, and he died while still writing. And he was um, still struggling with many issues. I, I haven't talked much about uh, the normative philosophy, which is, it came towards the end of his life. He had kind of avoided talking about ethics and aesthetics because he thought, you know, that, that really is not true philosophy. Towards the end of his life, he realized, Wow, it is. And, and ethics and aesthetics actually are related to the theory of right reasoning, which is also logic. And so he started writing about that. And I actually presented a paper in, in Sao Paulo about his struggles with trying to talk about aesthetics, uh, which is something, again, that he had totally ignored for most of his life. So he was still writing philosophy when he died. So his philosophy is unfinished in that sense, but it's also unfinished in the sense that there's still a lot of stuff most people have not seen, people outside of the Purse Edition project. And as the, um, the writings, which is what the Purse Edition project calls its volumes, as they come out, I'm sure we will find a lot more interesting things that Peirce said that, that we can then analyze. The, traditionally, it's been the collected papers. There's eight volumes of them. 
but like I said, they are thematic and they, they run the whole gamut of his life. The writings are a good source because they're chronological, so you can see the development of his theories. However, they only cover the first few years of his career because there's still many more volumes left to be done. Now, the Purse Edition Project did come out with two volumes called The Essential Purse, which has his famous published papers and other papers that he presented in, in his lectures. He gave lectures at the Lowell Institute in Boston. He was also invited to give lectures at Harvard and in several series of lectures, and, and so those are included as well in the essential purse. So in terms of, of o original works, I, I would recommend someone to perhaps start out with the essential purse. Now going back to knowledge again, Purse tried to find a midpoint, we can say, between dogmatism and skepticism. And again, we go back to Descartes. Remember that Descartes was trying to avoid skepticism, which is that position that says that we, since we can doubt everything, we cannot really claim to know anything. So, you know, we have to suspend uh, belief. And so what Descartes does, he says, okay, so I will become first the ultimate skeptic, doubt everything, and then come to see if I can really believe something and then work my whole system on, based on that foundation. Well, Peirce thought that both dogmatism, which is what uh, Descartes pretty much said when he said, you know, I have this certain belief that I cannot doubt, I think, therefore I am, um, that was dogmatism. I, Peirce thought, you know, that's not quite right. And then, of course, the other extreme, skepticism, you know, just doubt everything. Peirce thought that, yes, indeed, we can have knowledge. He thought that there is such a thing as truth, which is, he, he defined as you know, the final opinion that, that a community of inquirers will, will come to, given um, the sufficient um, amount of time. But Peirce did think that we can have knowledge of things without being dogmatic. Peirce thought that, that this is actually how we relate to, to nature. We have a certain system of beliefs that we have pretty good assurance that is correct, and there's several reasons for that, right? If we've used the scientific method, we've kind of gotten rid of individual error, but also the idea of cynicism, the idea of continuity which has a Darwinian bent in how he explains it in knowledge. Mainly, the fact that we guess right a lot of the time, Peirce thought was really an evolutionary characteristic that human beings have acquired. Those that don't guess right, they don't survive. But the whole, the whole um, human race, they have acquired this characteristic. You guess right a lot of the times. So we do have reason to think that whenever we guess at something, we have a good idea. And of course, that's hypothesis, which is abduction, which is one of the three arguments used in scientific method, right? And then of course we have deduction, which we look at the necessary consequence of, of, of that guess, right? And then we have induction, which is the testing of that guess. That's the scientific method. So we have reason to think that we do have knowledge because of cynicism, because of the scientific method. However, we cannot be dogmatic because at any moment, any single of our belief can be doubted. So the interesting thing about Peirce is he calls it contrite fallibilism. Any particular belief can be doubted. It can be wrong. And he says any scientist worth her medal has, um, has to have this conviction that any belief that I have can at any moment be questioned because that's really the real search for truth. You have to be open to at any moment, like he says, you have a cartload of beliefs, you have to be ready to just dump the whole thing at the moment when experience makes you question that belief. So contrite fallibilism really says, 
I'm, I'm not going to doubt everything that I believe. I really believe that my set of beliefs is true until I am proven otherwise by experience. And, and he categorizes experience as teaching us through cruel jokes. <laughs> because indeed, you know, that's when, you know, it's when experience hits us that we realize, wow, you know, that's really not how I really thought that the world was. Peirce was a pioneer in, in semiotics, and he is known for the distinction between type token that we use all the time. And he also talked about how there are um, icons and indices and symbols. These are terminologies that he also used when he talked about semiotics. And these are different kinds of signs. An icon is a sign that signifies by resemblance. Just like in, in, an example would be a portrait is an icon of a person because the portrait resembles a person. An index signifies by somehow pointing or by some causality. Like for example, smoke signifies fire, right? So smoke is pointing, hey, there's fire because there's some sort of a causality. And if I point with my finger, that's also an, an index, right? If I point, you say, oh, I have to look there, right? The third kind of general sign is a symbol. And this is when something signifies by convention. So language, words, these are symbols. This is just some basic terminology that he talked about when he talks about his um, theory of semiotics. He, in the end, he, he talked about the pragmatic maxim in, also in terms of semiotics. And he, he liked to do this all the time, like I said, a Rubik's Cube, right? And, and uh, instead of, of his original talk about the meaning of pragmatism being the, the meaning of hard concepts, he talks about uh, pragmatism being about the meaning of symbols and, and signs. Because again, the sign is how we think. That is the basis of all thought. <laughs>